Let me start with this box. I'm going to hold it up here. Maybe they can get it on the camera. Now, some of, I walked through the crowd. I know some of you recognize this box. Some of you have no clue what this box might be. Does anybody know? Anybody want to yell out what this is? It's a cable box. Of course, it's a cable box. And I think it's not too long ago, but maybe it was 30 years ago. I was the bratty little kid in my family that begged my parents day after day, we got to get cable, we got to get cable, we got to get cable. And uh, my parents finally gave in. I'm learning that too, I'm a parent. They finally came in and, and we got cable TV at our house. And I remember coming home from school that day in the afternoon and getting the box in front of me and being thrilled, going through all the buttons and watching all the TV shows. And that night my dad came home from work and he walked into the living room and he looked at this cable box and he said there's no one under God's green earth that needs 37 channels of television. <laughs> Today I'm going to talk a little bit about when data starts to travel faster and faster, what's happened since that moment in time in my house to where we are today and when you get to gigabit speed, what might happen in a city tomorrow. And I can't resist starting in my house today either. I have two sons, a 14-year-old and a 10-year-old, and um, they're the ones always begging for things, and I give in to them. But three things happened when Google Fiber came to the Reardon household. The first was when I told my 14-year-old that Google was going to install gigabit speed fiber into our house, he hugged me. <laughs> Think about that for a second. A 14-year-old boy hugs his dad. The other impactful thing about that was it was the first time he ever hugged me about anything that I did while I was mayor. And after we got it hooked up, um, some of the fighting went away, not all of it, but my 10-year-old and 14-year-old used to fight. If he was on the Xbox, my 10-year-old was on the computer, the bandwidth would sort of go down to a trickle, they'd be arguing, you need to turn it off, I'd have to intervene, my wife would too, that went away. Everything streamed just great. And then I became obsessed with speed, internet speed, which I had never done before, and perhaps it's more of a guy thing than anything, but I never checked my speed before I got Google Fiber. But now that I can go a gig, I want to go a gig all the time. So if I check speed, which I do regularly, and I'm at 700 or 800 megabytes down, I'm telling the kids to turn stuff off, turn the devices down. We've got to get back up above 900. I don't think I need 900 right now, but if I can go that fast, I want to go that fast. You know, we were the first um, Google Fiber city. And when Google said, raise your hand, cities, if you're interested in gigabit speed deployment into a city, we did what 1,100 other cities did. Um, that's nearly every city of scale in the United States. We all applied, and on the other end of that, we were selected first. Now, a lot of people have asked me, well, how did that happen? Did, did um, Sergey call you? Did somebody just say, hey, you won? It wasn't like Willy Wonka giving you the golden ticket, unfortunately. We worked for two years with Google on a public-private partnership, and while gigabit speed is really fiber traveling, you know, at the speed of light, installing it's very physical. And so it took time for this to happen in our city. And what's really great about being with you today is you're in that process too in Mississippi with C Spire selecting nine cities and now Jackson. You're just a couple steps behind where Kansas City, Kansas was not all that long ago. Now, when Google set the system up in Kansas City, much like what's going on in Mississippi, they said, you know what, we're going to figure out where we're going by you, individuals, telling us who wants it. So you had to get online and sign up for Google Fiber in order to get it, and they divided our community into what they called fiber hoods or distinct neighborhoods. And so we worked really hard to make sure that the required number of people that in those parts of town raised their hand on the internet and got signed up to get Google Fiber. It was an amazing process. And over that period of time that we worked on this, and now that it's been installed, really four significant things happened that we just flat out didn't expect. And the first was around economic development. Now, I'm a former mayor. We're all about economic development when you're mayors, you're going to bring business to the city. And in Kansas City, like many other cities, our infrastructure around economic development kind of worked like this. 
okay, we'll go out and find that, um, that company in some other city and we'll give them a tax break. We'll, get them, we'll do something to entice them to move from that city to our city. And then the mayor gets to go out and cut the ribbon and celebrate that this company moved to town and there's jobs coming. That's how, in fact, that's still how we do it. And many cities do. And we thought when Google Fiber was installed, we had this naive perception perhaps that we could go down to Texas and talk Dell into moving from Texas to Kansas City, Kansas. That was going to be the economic development win. And it didn't happen at all. That's not what happened. Dell hasn't moved from Texas. No real giant company has yet to come to Kansas City because of Google Fiber. What happened was really more significant than we at first thought. So remember, I told you about the fiber hoods. You had to raise your hand, turn it green. That's how it had to happen. And it's divided up in the city and really fortuitously because of where we are today. The first fiber hood in Kansas City, Kansas was the neighborhood right next to the Academic Medical Center, the University of Kansas in our community. That, that was the neighborhood where they raised their hands the quickest, the fastest, and they were installed first. And once that was announced, and let me say this neighborhood is, is not the fanciest neighborhood in town. It's not the poorest neighborhood in town. It has smaller, older homes um, with some really great people that are in them, but not a lot of development had happened there in a long time. You know, it was just a good, solid, stable neighborhood. And once Google Fiber announced it was the first fiber hood, young people, startups, entrepreneurs started moving to this part of our city on their own. And they started renting houses, buying houses, figuring out ways to get into that part of town so that they could get access to the gigabit infrastructure that was being built there. Now, over the course of time, about 25 to 30 of them settled in the neighborhood. And we learned that it wasn't just about the connectivity, it was about the desire for creative entrepreneurs to be around one another as well. They defined themselves. It's called the Kansas City Startup Village. Um, it's out there on the internet. I'd wished that the government could have said that we had something to do with it. We didn't, other than offering the opportunity for the infrastructure. And what's happened since then is they've been on nearly every news show across the country and really around the world. We have visitors of all sorts that come to this neighborhood. Steve Case was there a week and a half ago to meet with the folks in the Kansas City Startup Village. A young person that saw this coming went out and bought a house, took his life savings, bought a house in this neighborhood, and created something called Homes for Hackers. So if you want to come to Kansas City, Kansas, and you've got a startup and not a whole lot of capital, and you want to get quick access to gigabit speeds, he's offering six months free rent, free high-speed internet to locate within the startup village. Truly was remarkable. And in the flip of what we thought, it's this dynamic of startups and young people that now is attracting larger companies. So there's a whole slew of them, but for instance, most recently, a French cloud computing company was looking to locate its North American um, base in, in the United States. They selected Kansas City, not because some big tax deal was offered to them, but because they saw this innovative dynamic going on there, and they wanted their company to be a part of it. The second thing that sort of surprised us too was, and it hit us really like a ton of bricks, was if you start to turn on certain parts of the city because people are raising their hands and other parts don't raise their hands, aren't you really creating a digital divide? Isn't there a chance that what could happen is a sort of a new version of the have and have nots? Now, we started to see this dynamic play out. I mean, it, it did happen. And we got out into the neighborhoods and worked really hard to make sure that all the neighborhoods that we could get turned on, and we did nearly every one of them, got turned on so that they would have access to the internet. But the truth of the matter is, is that as we went out into our community, there were large swaths where people didn't understand fully what it meant to be part of the digital economy that many of you take for granted. And what we've heard today shows us what the future might be. They didn't see it as relevant to them. And we knew that had to be addressed. And again, good people came together and two significant things happened. A nonprofit called Connecting for Good was created to provide those opportunities. And Connecting for Good, as their first project, to, took two public housing areas and created a mesh Wi-Fi network so that residents in those areas could get access to the internet at no charge. Well, that takes part of the, um, part of the aspect of it 
and solves it. But the second part was the relevance. And so they opened up learning centers within those areas of our city where an individual in the public housing development or in the neighborhood could come and get access to good learning about what the internet was, know the tools, get to know them. And if they made a commitment to that, at the end of the day, they would get a laptop computer at little to no charge, fixing or remedying to the extent that they could the relevance and the access. Great dedicated companies and individuals came together and created the Kansas City um, Digital D Divide Fund. And that digital inclusion fund really sought and continues to seek with its million dollars of funding, those nonprofits that are willing to take a step forward and try to solve the digital divide. So one of the fun examples that we've seen in Kansas City is at one of our libraries now, um, young people can come in and use digital photography to really take an honest look at what their neighborhood is today. And then using that digital photography in Minecraft, using gameplay can start to vision what the future of their neighborhood ought to look like. The third thing that su surprised us as well is how this fiber infrastructure, which certainly is technology-based, could light a fire on sort of a greater movement within Kansas City. And that movement about really small business and creativity and entrepreneurialism has just taken off since Google Fiber has come, since gigabit speeds are available. And the most tangible example of that, I think, is a process that occurs at the Kauffman Foundation, which is a great nonprofit in Kansas City, um, focused on entrepreneurialism. They hold a meeting once every week on Wednesday. You could come next week, We'd, I'd love to have you there. Next Wednesday, it's called One Million Cups. And at One Million Cups, the concept is simply this. Two or three entrepreneurs or startups get to present in front of an audience their business concept and where they are with it, and then they get the feedback and the institutional knowledge and all of that interaction that they need to move that business forward. It's, it's just taken off, it's on fire, quite frankly. If you came with me next week to Million Cups on Wednesday, two to 300 people would be in the room. It happens every week. And in fact, this entire concept is now in dozens of cities across the United States. And I think it's actually going, getting ready to go international. I can't think of a better place than in Jackson for that kind of dynamic in some form to take place as you enter into this gigabit city process that, that we've been in. Then the next thing I think that was significant that happened in Kansas City that, that surprised us somewhat, it was, uh, was that connecting, connecting parts of our city digitally at gigabit speeds actually had a chance to connect us personally as well. So I told you a little bit about how the fiber hoods work. Uh, and of course, it became very aware at the very beginning of this that it was going to take a collective effort to turn all of our fiber hoods green, to get enough people to say yes. And the incredible thing that happened, particularly rewarding for a mayor, is that we had young people enthusiastically stepping forward to say, I'll be that ambassador. I'll go out to those neighborhoods. I will interact with individuals to get them as excited as I am about what this means to the future of our city. And in so many cities, with so many elected officials, when you get together and you talk, you lament the fact that young people, we can't figure out how to get them civically engaged. We want them to be involved in what's going on at the community or government level. How do we do that? And Google Fiber offered that opportunity in Kansas City. Young people became the ambassadors for what gigabit speeds might mean to a community. Young people were the ones that went out in the front lines, that met with the neighborhood groups, that met with the community organizations and made the case for gigabit architecture being installed within the city of Kansas City. The other thing that happened was that we, we felt that this kind of infrastructure was so fundamentally important to our city um, and strategically important to our future that we ought to try to break down barriers with it. So Kansas City, Kansas, the smaller of the two Kansas cities, I will confess, uh, was the first to be selected as uh, Google Fiber City. City two was Kansas City, Missouri, our neighbor right across the river. Mayor Sly James of Kansas City, Missouri and myself sat down at a table and said, it's time to break down that state line barrier between Missouri and Kansas. It's time for us to take all that we know about this future that we are endeavoring to, to move forward with and leverage it against our region as a whole. So we formed the Mayor's Bi-State Innovations Team. 
a collective group of individuals from both Kansas City, Kansas, and Kansas City, Missouri, that sought to fully understand what the potential future would be with gigabit speeds being installed, fiber to the home, across these two cities. And in so doing, to break down those traditional governmental structural barriers between one city and another, with between city and suburb, however it permeates um, in a community, to break those down. And we had an amazing experience in doing that. I mean, people had to learn how to figure out uh, how to break those barriers down, but when they did, things took off. And they created for us in Kansas City what we call a playbook. And that playbook took so many of the elements, some of which you've heard today, that we think are critical to the future that gigabit speeds can have an impact on, like education, like healthcare and telehealth, like the digital divide, like entrepreneurialism and building communities around small business, took those and created tangible ways for our city to move forward and, lev and leverage this infrastructure against that opportunity. The playbook's being executed today. In fact, a permanent group called KC Digital Drive exists as sort of the keeper of the playbook and the facilitator of all that activity across Kansas City, Kansas, and Kansas City, Missouri. And the significant thing that's happening around that is it's giving us an opportunity to change our brand or widen our brand as a city as a whole. So now, it doesn't come as a surprise because it's happened so many times that Kansas City is sort of rising up on the list of, of cities that you want to go to, of cities that are tech friendly, of cities that are good to start small businesses within. Those things have happened because of the momentum that this infrastructure has given us and our ability to work together. Proof positive of that, quite frankly, is the mayor of Kansas City, Kansas, the former mayor of Kansas City, Kansas, is presenting before you in Jackson, Mississippi, I can say in the, that's probably the first time in history that that's ever happened. <laughs> so let me go back to this cable box. Remember at the very beginning, the box, 37 channels. I can't imagine you need anything more than that. And I'll pull out what many of you are using right now that's in your pocket too, a device that streams video and the world to you as you sit in this room today. And I would contend to all of you that that progression from the day that my dad could not see be beyond 37 channels, I probably couldn't either, to today with this device in my hand only happens when data is able to travel at speeds that allow that to occur. So we know what's happened in our cities as we've come here today. The exciting thing for Kansas City, Kansas, for Jackson and cities across Mississippi is we're at the cusp of what's going to happen next. And while I've given you a flavor of some things that surprised us in the short time that we've had it in Kansas City, Kansas, none of us quite know what's going to happen next, but we're on that journey together. The seed's been planted in Kansas City, Kansas and here, and I can't wait to see what's gonna happen next. Thank you all very much.